time, the effort uh, that they have given to us, oh God. And Lord, we thank you, oh God, for when they have reflected uh, your attributes, oh God, and helping us, oh God, loving us and caring for us and having showing grace and mercy toward us, oh God. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, we ask you, oh God, that you would touch us, <coughs> that you would touch us today, oh God, with your word. Help us, oh God, to be the people you're calling for us to be. Lord, we thank you. We pray that Brian be decreased, that you be increased, that the words we receive from my mouth would not be mine, but, uh, but yours, oh God. And so, Lord, we pray, oh Heavenly Master, you would have your way with us today. Lord, we pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. I mean, Second Samuel chapter twenty-one, verses ten through fourteen. These words are recorded there, and if, if you don't have them, they're, they're up on the screen. <coughs> Excuse me. It says, "Now Rispa, the um, daughter of Aiah, took sackcloth and spread it for herself on the rock, and from the beginning of harvest until the late rains poured on them." from heaven and she did not allow the birds of the air to rest on them by night <coughs> excuse me by day nor the beasts of the field by night and David was told with Respa the daughter of Aiah uh, the concubine of Saul had done and then David went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan his son from the men of Jabez Gilead, who had stolen them from the street of Beth Shan, uh, where, where the Philistines had hung them up after the Philistines had struck down Gaul, Saul in Gilboa, Gilboa. So he brought up the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his son, from there, and they gathered the bones of those who had been hung. They buried the bones of Saul and Jonathan, his son, in the country of Benjamin uh, Zila, in the tomb of Kish, his father. So they performed all that the king commanded. And after that, God heeded the prayer for the land. If you'll allow me to use the subject uh, this morning, I would like to use this subject. That is what moves me. If you don't mind, say that. That is what moves me. Amen. We're so thankful to be here in the house of God one more time. And, and we want to um, uh, just uh, keep this at the forefront of our mind as we are looking at our passage today. That it says, that is what moves me. And I know in our own lives, there are a lot of things that move us, that, that get us to going, you know, uh, I'm one that, that, that doesn't mind watching a movie. I, I don't watch them as much as I used to, but, but uh, and, and y'all heard me say that I'm a Hallmark wa watcher, and so uh, I, w I watch Hallmark and, and those uh, kind of TV shows or movies like that, and, and my wife would watch Lifetime, and so uh, the kids could tell the difference uh, what shows were whose, depending on what was on the, the you know, on the DVR because one would say the killer babysitter and the other one would say uh, the babysitter falls in love, you know, um, you know. But but the whole point is, is that, you know, uh, everybody has their different tastes and everybody has different things that will get you going. Uh, some folk like sports. Some folks like to go out and perform sports. Some folks just like watching them. Uh, but we all are different with what comes to move us, to get us to go and that makes us happy, that makes us jump up to, uh, as they would say, what gets you up in the morning? What, what gets you to going on today? Well, today, I, I want us to just look at a few things that are right here in our text, and then, then I'm going to leave you alone. Uh, but I want you to see here that, first of all, that the individual in the text was moved by the law moved by the law. What, what are you talking about, preacher? Well, I'm, I'm so glad you asked, but look, look at verses 1 and 2. Look what happened there. It says, there was a famine in the days of David for three years. 
It says, year after year, and David inquired of the Lord. So let me just stop there just to help you to understand. He says, hold up, a famine came. You know, first year, you know, stuff didn't go right. What, no rain, drought. You know, just say, hey, no big deal. But the reason the writer stuck in here year after year, because he said, hold up, first year something happened. Uh, you know, no rain. All right, well, just, you know, weather changes, stuff happens. Okay, second year no rain. It's like, hold up, I'm starting to get a little concerned. But then the third year show up and ain't no rain. David said, hold up, hold up. Something ain't right. Something ain't right. So what did it do? David inquired of the Lord and asked God, why in the world do we have a drought, a famine going on in the land? If, if I could stop right there, I would like to, for us to just think in our own lives when things ain't going right. It's just good for us to just ask God, why in the world is this happening? I, I had a Sunday school teacher when I was a, a, a young teenage boy. His name was uh, Brother Gilead, and he, he would say, if he asked, he said, look, if, if you ask God and things ain't going right, ask God what, what's, what the problem is. And if he bring your sin to your mind, then you know why. <laughs> You know why this is happening, because you've been doing this or doing that and doing whatever. But, but he says, but if he don't bring anything to your mind, then you know it's just a test. And he said, it's just a test, and you just hold on, because it's just a test, and God is testing your faith. And so I, I, I've lived by that. I, I, I've just incorporated that into my life. And that's exactly what David is doing here. He's inquiring of the Lord. And guess what the Lord said? The Lord said, it is because of Saul and his bloodthirsty house because he killed the Gibeonites. And, and, and you, you know, this is, you know, you, you, hopefully y'all understand this because you, you've been reading, right? Yeah, y'all been reading with us. And so, so, look, he gives an understanding here. He says, so the king call, called the Gibeonites and, and spoke to them. And, and, and now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. And the children of Israel had sworn protection to them, but Saul had sought to kill them in his zeal for the children of Israel and Judah. Now let me back step. 400 years earlier, the children of Israel are going into the promised land. They get into the promised land. Now God had gave them uh, some instructions. Don't make any covenants. Don't make no pacts. Don't make no promises. No vows to those that are in the land. He says, but I want you to carry out my instructions. But the Gibeonites, they heard that the Israelites were coming. They saw them coming. They saw what they did to, to Jericho. They saw what they did to Ai. And so they wouldn't. They wouldn't. They was on next on the horizon. And so they, they plotted a plan. They said, hey, what we're going to do is, is we're going we're gonna to put on some old clothes. We're going we're gonna to go get some molded and stale bread. And we're going to act like we came from a long ways away. We, we're going to act like we came from a far country. We're going to show up and, and, and we're going to say, hey, we heard about your God. And, 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 and we just want to be with y'all. We just want to make peace with y'all. And, 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 and they an analyzed. The, the, the bread, they said, oh, it's bread. They said it was hot. They said it was hot and fresh when we left. Uh, it wasn't. It was molded when they left. And, and, and the text tells us in Joshua that the problem was is they did not inquire of the Lord. You know, that's something that, that we should make note of is that in our lives that a lot of times we're, we're, we're making promises, we're doing things, and we're, but did you do Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Did you trust in the Lord with all your heart? Lean not to your own understanding. and all your ways acknowledge him so that he could direct your path. So we see in Je Je uh, Joshua chapter 9, verse 15, look what it says. So Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant with them to let them live. And the rulers of the congregation swore to them. So they, they, they made a covenant. They made it with them. And then guess what? They found out that these folk were really their neighbors. They were right next. They came right to them. And so guess what happened? Uh, he said that folk got upset. They, they, they said, man, we, we, we want to kill them. But he said, no, no, can't do this. 
But look what Joshua just said. This we will do in verse 20 to them. We will let them live lest wrath be upon us because of the oath which we swore to them. See, I want to remind you of something, and this is very important because I said uh, uh, David is moved by the law because look what he says here in Numbers chapter 30. It says, if a man makes a vow to the Lord or swears an oath to bind himself by some agreement, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. See, God, God really, really meant what he said. Uh, he, he means that when you promise, when you say, hey, I'm going into this contract, I'm going into this agreement, this covenant, and it is before God, I'm going to do this. I promise I'm going to do it. God says, don't you break it. You better do according to all that you said. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 23. Look what it says there. He says, when you make a vow to the Lord your God and you shall not delay to pay it. He says, when you say you're going to do it, I promise the Lord. He said, don't you delay. Huh? Don't, don't have step. Don't delay to pay it for the Lord your God will surely require it of you. And it shall be sin to you. See, that's what happened here because they made a promise to the Gibeonites, although they had been tricked, although they had, they, they, they had the wool poured over their eyes, God still held them to their promise, their vow, their commitment because they should have asked God before they went into this thing. And so David says, hold up, hold up. I, I, God, God said, hold up, <coughs> you got to stand on my law, on my word. You got to do it according to what I said. And God said, if you made a vow, you better do what it said. And so we find here in our text that he will move by the law. But then, look here, we also move by loyalty. Move by loyalty. What are you talking about, preacher? Well, you, you know, you got the story that it goes on and says, David called up the Gibeon Knights and said, hey, you know what? What, what? what needs to happen? What needs to happen? Because they had made the Gibeon Knights uh, woodcutters and, and, and water carriers for the, for the temple and for the tabernacle. And so they were supposed to be workers and they put them under uh, work to work for the children of Israel because they had lied. They had uh, been disloyal and they, they were not right. But, but then David calls them in and says, hey, well, what do you want? Because... God then told me the reason this is happening. And we, we're not quite sure why Saul decided he wanted to just kill them out. The Bible says here is because of the zeal that he had for the children of God. And, and we ought to be careful there because I, I believe you can get arrogant. You can take stuff and run with it, you know, and you can go beyond what God wants. You can start doing what you think and how you feel and how you see it. And you'll leave God's word way in the dust. Because you'll be like, oh, see, but I, I feel like, I think, I did. And I believe that's what Saul did. Saul just like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to eradicate all these people that, that don't supposed to be here with us. I'm going to get rid of them. But he didn't take into account that a promise had been made, a covenant had been made, a contract had been made. And so it caused this famine to come upon the land. And so we have David talking to them, and they said, well, what do you want? What do you want? They said, well, we don't want no silver. We don't want no gold. And it says, because we want life for life. They said, folk have, they killed us, tried to stamp us out. So the giver and I said, hey, give us seven men of the descendants of Saul. Now, True enough, y'all. I ain't got time to unpack, and, and, and I know you might have questions like, why is this, and how all this going on? I ain't got time for all that. Come to Bible study. You can ask all the questions you want to. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> all right. But look what happens. So David, had, it tells us right here in the text. Look what David said. But the king said, hold up. The sinners of Saul, he's like, hold up. I, 
he says, I just found one of the Jonathan's sons. And he one of the males as of the descendants of Saul. But look what the king did. The king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Jan Jonathan, the son of Saul, because, hold up, he had also made an oath. He had also made a promise, a pact between Jonathan and himself. And he like, hold up, if breaking covenants got us in this mess, <laughs> I can't break another covenant in order to try to get us out. So he said, hold up, I can't, I can't, put, I can't put him up there because David and Jonathan uh, were like brothers. Matter of fact, if you go back to 2 Samuel chapter 9, you'll see that, that, that after it was all done, so David just said, hold up, hold up. I, I'm just wondering, is there anyone, anyone still left? Jonathan's dead. Saul is dead. We know the two main characters are gone. A, a lot of the brothers are gone. He says, but is there anyone left of the house of Saul? Now think about what David is saying. That I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake, because I made an oath, I made a pact, I made a promise, and I'm going to be loyal to what I promise. Look what it says in verse 2 of that same chapter 9. It says, and there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him to David, uh, the king said to him, are you Ziba? And he said, uh, at your service. And look what happened in verse 3. Then the king said, is there not still anyone or someone of the house of Saul to whom, and I love the way he changes it. At first he says that I can show kindness, but look what he says here, that I may show the kindness of God. He says, hold up, I want to show God's kind of kindness on him. And he says, well, there's still a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. And if you know, remember the story, you know what happened. David, David said, hold up. He says, well, what I want to do is I want to show the kindness of God. All of the lands that belong to King Saul, I'm restoring them and giving them to Mephibosheth. He says, but not just that. He says, well, you got those that have served the house of Saul. He says, Ziba, he says, you and your nine sons. He says, what I want you to do is work the land. He says, I want you to work it in order to bring the produce of the land. But don't worry Mephibosheth ain't going to eat that food because he going to eat at the king's table every day. And so we see the kindness of God being shown to him because David understood that it's better not to make a vow than to make one and break it. Ecclesiastes says this, when you make a vow to God, do not delay to pay it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you have vowed. Remember Matthew chapter 5? This is what he's talking about. He says, your yes ought to mean yes, and your no ought to mean no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. Uh, you, you know, you know, I know when I was a kid, uh, how you said, oh, oh, I promised I was going to do that. And, and, and then they said, oh, go ahead, Brian, you're supposed to do that. I said, I had my fingers crossed. I had my fingers crossed. Uh, you, know, that, you know, that was our way of saying, I'm out of it. I really didn't mean what I said because you didn't see I had my fingers crossed. But God said, that ain't the way Christians ought to operate. That's not the way we ought to do. When we make promises, when we say we're going to do what we're going to do, we ought to be loyal. I remember my daddy had made a, a, a similar pact with, with a friend of his. His name was Pat, and Pat had a grocery store. At, and I remember we would be in the, in, uh, riding with daddy and going around because he would be working on different houses and stuff. And, and, and somewhere along the line, we, we figured out exactly where Pat's store was. We knew every exit, every off-ramp. And, and man, we would become giddy like little kids, uh, you know, when, when we figured daddy was going in that direction.
direction. He he would get off. It was over there in Hollywood and 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 in that air Chelsea area over in there. And we knew what street to turn on and and and, and the reason we were so giddy because when we would go to Pat's store, we didn't need no money. We would go in there and, and, and Pat would say, get whatever you want. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and we be, you know, we, we trying to restrain ourselves. Me and Drake, we going in there to restrain ourselves. We looking around, looking at daddy like, one bag of chips? And, 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 and Pat would be like, don't worry about him. I say it. Get what you want. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> we go back there, you know, they would make it, you know, when they slice that meat, make the slice that bologna, slice that ham back there. And he said, what kind of sandwich y'all want? Tell them whatever you want. Put it on that sandwich. And, man, we come out there, man, we had sandwiches and drinks and, and stuff. Man, we ain't had to pay nothing. I'm like, and I remember my daddy saying, he said, me and, and Brother Pat had made a, made a promise that whoever die first, I'm going to watch out for their family. And if I die first, they're going to look out for my family. I, I'm, I'm just saying, yo, yes, I to mean yes. And yo, no, I to mean no. And even after Jonathan was gone, his promise, what he said he was going to do was still on his mind. And so he says, well, I got to give up seven. Got to give up seven, but I can't. Now, one of the other guys' name was Mephizoshaph. He had the same name, but it wasn't Jonathan's son. He said, I got to give up seven, but I, I, I can't do that. And so he says, because we have violated what God wanted. We, did, we didn't hold our promise as a nation before God. And, we, and Saul went to stamp out the Gibeonites. And God has shut up the heavens that it won't rain. And we're going to all perish after a while. If, if we don't fix this, if we don't settle this. And so what did they do? They, they brought those two sons that came from Z, uh, Zepha and then uh, the other five that came from Saul's other daughter, not, I know in some of our translations it said Micah, but it was uh, Merib, the, the first daughter, the one that was promised to David at first, but you know, there's another promise that was broken. But anyway, and so, uh, uh, so here we have the, those five along with those other two and the two from Saul's concubine, and, and so they were hung. And that brings us to the third thing, moved by love. Moved by law, moved by the law, moved by loyalty, and moved by love. Look what we have here. Uh, Respa, the, the daughter of Aisha, took the sackcloth and spread it for herself on the rock. And so uh, just a picture that the sackcloth was used in order for mourning, but she took this sackcloth and she kind of made like a tent, put it across the rock so she could get under it in order to hold so she could stay there because what it was her, her job, what was her, her love, what was her devotion? She said, hold up. I, uh, it says from the beginning of harvest. Harvest was in April, like mid-April, and, 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 and it lasted all the way to November and said for some Six months, some six months before the rain was supposed to show up in November, she stayed there. And what it said, and she did not allow the birds of the air to rest on them by day, nor the beast of the field by night. Look at verse 11. And David was told what Raspa, the daughter of Ai. Ai, uh, Aiah, uh, the concubine of Saul, had done. And so what do we, what do we have here? What do we have here? You, you have this devotion of this mother who, who two of her sons were, had been hung. And, 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 and she said, hold up. I, 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 I cannot, I cannot, I cannot just allow this disgrace to happen to them. Because y'all remember the story when, when David got ready to fight against Goliath. And he said, man, who are you, man? I'm going to take you and I'm going to 
feed you to the birds of the air. See, it was a disgrace thing to, to allow the animals to pick at the dead. That's why they would say, we need to hurry up and bury them. You see, that's why we have here, it says in Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 22, 23, uh, it says that a man has committed a sin, deserving of death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on the tree. Verse 23, it says, his body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but you shall surely bury him that day so that you do not defile the land which the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance, for he who is hung is a curse of God. And so she says, hold up, I'm, I, I don't want the, my, my, the, these bodies to just stay here and let the animals, because we don't have a proper burial for them. It, uh, the proper uh, thing has not been done. And so she's out there running the ravens away, running the buzzards away, running the animals away, the lions that were trying to get at the bodies because of her love, because of her devotion. She didn't just stay one day, two days, but almost six months she stayed out there. And then the king heard about it. And then he went and got the bones of Saul and got the bones of Jonathan that had not been properly buried and got all of them and took them to their father's tomb named Kish and he properly buried them all. I just stopped by to say this is what moves the Lord. Because look what happened. Look at the end. They says after they had done all this, just look at the very last part of the verse. And after that God heeded the prayer for the land. Don't, don't forget, my brothers and sisters, that even years later, Solomon said, if we done messed up, we done done wrong, we hadn't done what we supposed to do, and we turn ourselves toward this place. He says, Lord, will you hear us? And here's God's response. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. He says, then I will hear from heaven. So God said from heaven, he'll hear your prayers. Then I will forgive their sins and heal their land. God is moved when you follow his law. He's moved when you're loyal to what you promise. He's moved by the love that we show not only to him but to those within our spirit. That's what moves him. So the question is, what moves you? Are you loyal to God, to his law, to loving what he loves and hating what he hates and doing what he wants? Are you trying to massage God's law to fix it to what you want to do? God is calling for us today to allow God's word to truly move us. I can imagine just this concubine saying, I'm not just going to keep the buzzers off my two sons, but all of them. 
Do we have picks? Well, if it was lands, I would do it for lands, but not for Brother Bill. Y'all feel what I'm saying? We got love for some. Jesus said, a new commandment I give unto you. As I have loved you, love one another. By this, men will know that you are my disciples. And he wasn't talking about loving everybody in the whole wide world. He was talking about the brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. He says, they'll know you, my disciples, because you have love for one another. So we make vows, and we don't keep them. We promise we're going to do this, and we don't do it. How is God glorified in that?